Hi, my name's Caroline Beckett, and I've been reading Zechariah's story and thinking, my goodness, he's come a long way. At the beginning of the story, he was what you might call a settled leader. He was on a rotor. He was blameless in keeping the law. But he was a bit lacking in faith, in Gabriel's view at least. Now, nine months after his lockdown started, he's learned to let God disorganise and reorganise. Learned to listen. Learned to allow Elizabeth to take the lead. And found some faith from somewhere. Now the long silence is over. The long silence of 400 years in which prophecy has been muted. And the long silence of nine months for this priest. And he speaks praise with power. My name is Andy Griffiths and I've been reading Zechariah's hymn. Traditionally it's called the Benedictus. It used to be used at least once a day by all Anglican priests and in churches of different kinds. And it's a, such a good model of storytelling. I mean, basically, Zechariah is telling the story of Israel. And I expect priests like him did that quite a bit. But he's not doing it in the temple. He's doing it at home. He's telling this story to his son, John, as a story that John will have his own part in. Now, obviously, at eight days old, John isn't taking much of it in, we imagine. But let's assume that day after day, Bedtime story after bedtime story, Zechariah and Elizabeth spoke similar words, retelling God's story in a way that made sense of John's story. So baby John hears these words, and then toddler John hears, and then little child at infant school John hears them, and then at junior school he hears them, and then he reaches teenage years and, and his story is coming to life in the context of this big story of God. By the time he left home to go in and live in a desert and eat wild honey, because he was too unsettled to eat domesticated honey, he used to follow wild bees home and stick his head in the hive and eat the wild honey that he found there. But by the time that happened to John, he'll have heard this story literally hundreds of times. Abraham's there in the story. Exodus, David, the prophets. And the storyline is that God has acted in his people's past to bring justice, mercy, right worship, and an absence of fear. And God is about to act again to bring forgiveness of sins. And you, John, you will be the bridge between the past of Abraham and Moses and David and the prophets and the Lord whose way you will prepare. And it's an interesting approach, isn't it? Raising a rebel prophet who will shake things up by teaching him history and tradition. And that might seem like an unlikely means of preparation. But the history of God's people contains everything John will need to locate himself and his burning desire for righteousness and holiness and justice and transformation within the bigger story of God. We've been talking about community organising in these sessions. God is constantly disorganising and reorganising, disorganising and reorganising. And as we cooperate with him, there are stages to go through. Organising, then listening, then planning, then action through public storytelling. And in some traditions, we refer to that as testimony. And then ensuring that everyone gets a seat at the table, that everyone is heard. This Advent, we want to declare over you, you are a child of God. You can be used by God to bring real change that will allow your community to find its place at the seats of power and the table of God.
Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, for he will cause Advent dawn to rise on us and shine from heaven. Decisively in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, and one day completely when the world is put to rights, and there's no longer any gap between the world as it should be and the world as it is. And between the dawn of a new age in Jesus and the dawn of a new age when heaven and earth are made new, there were loads of little dawns, lots of little new ages beginning, dawn glimmering through the cracks whenever the world is shaken and unsettled. Oh, and I'm reminded of Leonard Cohen. There is a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, for he will shine upon those who live in the dark shadow of death. The dark shadow of death is not to be seen on a map, but at times of plague and unsettling, its contours show themselves in the beam of our wavering torchlight. And we, the unsettled, hope-filled people of God, living between the dawns, we have the task of living as a different kind of community, without the hierarchies and violence which so mar and darken our world, as if we were already in tomorrow's light. Small, unsettled, not over-ambitious communities in every neighbourhood. Small, unsettled communities marked by hope, justice, disorganising and reorganising, action and boldness creative minorities in partnership with other creative minorities. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, for he will guide our steps into the path of peace, of, of shalom, of the world as it should be. And you, child, God will take your faltering, unsettled, hopeful feet and direct them to love the world towards which, despite all the shadows, he feels a tenderness and mercy that he will recreate in you. He'll use our organising and our listening and our planning and our action and from them provoke the question, why do you live with this hope in you? in the sure knowledge that our living and learning and suffering has equipped us to answer the question by telling the story of Jesus the dawn who rose as Zechariah promised, was raised on the cross, rose from the dead, has risen to the right hand of God, has risen in our hearts and has given meaning to our own stories and will come again in a blaze of glory. Thank you for listening to us over the course of this unsettled Advent. I hope you've seen that we're realistic about the task God has given us, but we are not hopeless. We are not waiting for God, oh, but for another, doubtless very different, Benedictus. <laughs>